It's Isaiah 9 and 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's a very well-known scripture. And we, many a times we've read that. And, and lots of times we, we, we know that he's God. We, we, we know that he's everlasting. We, we know that he brings peace. And, and we look at it from the surface like that. And we just read through it. And, and we know the scripture by heart. We've heard it many a times. And we just read through it. And we notify people that he is those things. But we never really go into details about what those things are. We never really go into identifying what they mean. And so this time of the year, you know, with, with all the Christmas plays and all the sermons and, and, and all the time that we take to, to talk about Jesus, uh, and, and we need to focus on and truly understand the meaning of those names. Because this, this was Isaiah speaking about Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This word was written by the prophet Isaiah more than 700 years before Jesus ever come upon this earth, before the birth of Jesus. And that in itself, the, 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 the prophetic word that's being spoken, many people believe that the Bible is just a bunch of stories written after the fact, and that's all that they ever turn out to be is stories. But this should be a good representation of how the truth really is that 700 years before he ever even breathed a, a breath of life upon the earth as a man, he was spoke about and it was foretold. God is wonderful, that he is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Finding and understanding those names in scripture, we find that through that little verse there, there's eight words arranged in pairs. And each pair there is and speaks of something that is metaphysical or divine, Something that's just out there about the character of the son who was given. And the other word is more of a, a functional speaking word about the person, about what they do or the role that will be. And so you have wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And so the very first word that we come to in the first set of two is wonderful. Wonderful in the Hebrew, Hebrew is Pele, which I've heard in soccer. <laughs> Don't know all about it, but Pele. And it's, and it's used in Psalm 78 and 12 when it says, Marvelous things did he in the sight of their father in the land of Egypt. Marvelous means the same thing as wonderful. It's the same word represented in the Hebrew, Pele. Pele, wonderful, marvelous incomprehensible or beyond understanding divine that's a powerful statement the child who is coming is going to be the greatest of anything incomprehensible of who he is and what he is and what he will do incomprehensible divine the second word of that is counselor Isaiah 11 and 2 says that the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of counsel and of power. Counselor. Kings looking for wisdom from God, the counselor. So he is foretold to be marvelous, wonderful, divine, uh, incomprehensible, beyond understanding, Counselor with all wisdom and knowledge of all power and all things. Think about that. We look past it when we read that, 
that scripture that he's wonderful counselor, but that, that's so much more than, than me going to Gary for some advice uh, you know, on a Thursday because I'm going through something. I, I've got somebody that has access to everything that I would ever need access to. Uh, all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all, all things that could ever be foretold or ever known, he knows. And, 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 and he's beyond any understanding that I could ever grasp and all the knowledge that he has is beyond anything that I could ever comprehend. And he has it. And he is my wonderful counselor. And that's, that's a, it's a powerful thought that he is that. All understanding of the will of God. The counselor. The second one is mighty God. And the first word is mighty. The root word is, if I'm saying it right, is giver. Which means hero. A doer of great things. Mighty acts done by somebody who does things for people who are not able to do it on their own. We have talked about our servicemen and women that go into battle, go into war, go, go into the service of the people of this country to defend their rights and freedoms. They are out there doing something that maybe somebody else is not able or capable of doing, putting themselves on that front line to protect others. And so the, when you think about Jesus, when you think about him going to that cross, how much more so that he would give up his life? He said, it, it, it's, it's more so to give up your life for your friend. To give up your life for someone else. It means hero. It means, it means that, that he's mighty. It means that it, he does great things on behalf of others. When we think about King David, King David was a hero. Nothing like the hero that Jesus was, but at the same time, he was a hero. He, 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 he was a man that stood against a king. He was a, he was a man that, 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 that come into power and, and is known as one of the greatest kings to ever live. He is, a, he is a guy that was small in stature, but came against the giant, that came against his country, that came against his God. He was a hero. And that hero is nothing compared to Jesus. He's mighty. The word God is El. It's used between, you know, in many words to represent God. El Shaddai is a good thought, but it's used to refer to the one true God, the, the one creator, the one supreme being that's above all and through all and in all, the, the one God, no one else. And so you have hero God. It's saying hero God. Not somebody standing on the sidelines watching from a distance uh, uh, just waiting for you to make mistakes so he can tell you about all the things that you've done wrong, but a hero God that, that steps into your situation and, and leads you and guides you through and takes you by the hand and, and holds you close when you need a friend and, and counsels you when you need understanding and he's the wisdom giver that, that leads you in situations that you, you can't comprehend anymore. He, he is the hero God. He's the one that, that is crucified upon a cross for your salvation, for your redemption, for your every need, for your deliverance. A hero God. The third set of words is everlasting. Everlasting. The word speaks about forever. It means that it has no end and it has no beginning. No end and no beginning. We talk about when we do the marriage, about the ring, having no, there's no start and stop point. It's a perfect circle. It goes at constant. It's never ending. Never beginning. He's eternal. In Isaiah 57 and 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity. Eternity. Never ending, never beginning, just there. In all things, all time. God didn't just appear one day and say something. God's always been there. Whether man has always been there, whether the earth's always been there, God's always been there. And when the earth cease, may cease to exist or when man stops ceasing to exist as we know it now, he's still going to be there. He's eternal. It's everlasting. He's everlasting. He's not caught up in the restrictions. 
distractions that we see, when we talk about our time and we talk about our lives and we talk about all the stuff that we're capable or not capable of, God don't have restrictions. He is who he is and, and he does what he does. God does not change. He is forever. The second word of that is father. The best thing about a good father includes compassion, loving, caring, protecting, guidance, support, encouragement. And all the way throughout God's word, we hear that he's God the father. He's God the father. A good father leads by example. A good father teaches and counsels. A good father is there when you fall down and you get your boo-boo and, and he kisses it and makes it better and leads you on your way, shows you what you might have done wrong in times of trouble and, and, and opens up doors when you need to go through the right door. He's a good father and he's the father of all and above all and in all. He is our father today. And he is an encourager and a guider and a supporter and he's a loving, caring father because if he didn't love us, he wouldn't have sent his only begotten son to be crucified upon the cross. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give us the opportunity to repent of our sins. He would just put us to death and, and be done with us. But he's a loving father and a caring father and, and, and the word supports who he is. Psalms 103 and 13 says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him reverence him for those that reverence him not those that are cowering in the corner and in fear like some other people might speak but those that love him those that endure with him those that that just desire his presence those that reverence his word and his understanding and his knowledge and and, and want to be in his presence all the time those that love him he loves them he cares for them and he guides them it's not pity as you might think he, he's merciful He's a merciful father, forgiving, full of grace. And the fourth one is all grouped together as the prince of peace. We know what a prince is. It's a lot like a king. <laughs> and the word even teaches us that we all are going to be, I guess you could say, princes and princesses in God's kingdom. He's the Prince of Peace. Just remember those words that were given to us in the time, or given to the people at the time by Isaiah. They were in a, a, a situation of war. And they had a king that may not have been handling it so well. And at and, and, and every place, there was fear and gloom and darkness within, within that scripture. That, 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 they, that they, were just, they, they felt like they were just embattled on every hand. And, and it wasn't going real well. In Isaiah 8, it says God, it was God's people at that time are said to see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And to them, this word was given that there was a promise being made that they're going to see a great light and that this warfare is going to end because unto us a child is born and his name will be the Prince of Peace. And we read throughout Scripture about how things are temporal, temporal things. War on every hand, even in, even in the end, in Revelation, we're, we're hearing about how there's war and rumors of war. There's battles that are going to be looking that is going to be taking place on every hand. And, and we look at the world that we're in today every single time, whether you're on the news or hearing it from somebody or reading a story, somebody's hurting somebody. And, and, and whether it's uh, small battles on the street or at your job or across, uh, across oceans where people are threatening to murder people, hurt and harm people, there's wars on every hand. So we know that we're in those end times but these people had to believe that they were in that same predicament that we are now because they had war going all around them and they was threats of death all on every side by their enemies and they was darkness and gloom and fear but the scripture is teaching us that the prince of peace unto us a child is born who is going to be our great wonderful counselor mighty God and king we are going to be here for the Prince of Peace when he comes to the air to take us home. The Prince of Peace. There's going to be an end 
to the temporal things. Man believes that he is all in charge and that he's above all the things that this world could bring and that the more power and the more money or, or, the, or the more position that it has, that that automatically gives them some kind of favor and that they can go forward in that favor and do whatever they feel like doing. But there's gonna come a time when the Prince of Peace comes and the temporal things of this world that people think that they're holding on to that has so much power is going to find itself in such a weak predicament because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to come and the Prince of Peace is going to put an end to all those things that the world has brought our way. So the darkness, that temporal darkness that seems to be just flooding us on a daily basis and that, that aggravation and frustration and that, that hate and anger that sometimes can try to flow its way into you, you know, where people who have been saved for so long begin to doubt God because why would God do this and why would God allow that? He's not. He doesn't desire that for them. He doesn't desire us to be in those positions. And there is no doubt that he has probably most likely done every single thing imaginable, whether we could see it or comprehend it or not, to prevent it. But yet man is man and we're sinful in nature. And we create those dark environments. And we create that sin and that hate and that anger. And that's the reason places like Sodom and Gomorrah existed. God didn't create it. Man did. And so there's going to be temporal things upon this earth that will com combat us and battle us until he comes to take us home. But when he comes to take us home, we get to see that sweet peace that we speak of. We get a little bit of that temporal peace here because he gives it to us. But when we come into his presence of the Prince of Peace, we're gonna lose the temporal things. We're gonna lose the restrictions that are placed upon us. And we're gonna be placed into a position where our hearts can abound in him and our reverence of him can expand itself into a place where it never ends and we can be in that eternal forever with him. John 18 and 36 said, Jesus answered and he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from his. His kingdom is not of this world. We live in this world, but we're not part of this world. We're waiting on something better. The door is going to open and we're going to something better. This is just a temporal time for us to grow and do what he desires us to do and to be in the places and the positions where he desires and wants us to be. And if we listen and see the character of God, if we, if we stand on his will for our lives,